Let Him Go Barefoot is a podcast that dives into all things parenting and education through the lens of mindful awareness. Conversations aim to bring forward patterns, beliefs, and attitudes that shape our expectations and ideas about what it means to raise healthy children. With the blend of science, ancient wisdom, and intuition, we will explore ways to support, nurture, and connect with our growing children while also nurturing and expanding ourselves. I am grateful you are here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Let Him Go Barefoot podcast. Today, I am talking to Deb Adamson. You can find Deb on Instagram at Deb Adamson Books. And Deb is the author of how many books? Oh, my goodness. Well, already probably about six or seven and eight more coming out. Eight more coming out. Okay. And she's also was a homeschool mom. And Deb reached out to me through Instagram and I started reading her her backstory and she's so interesting and has a lot to share. And I welcomed her to the podcast because I think you will enjoy what she has to say and also um, learning about children's books and authoring and homeschooling through the years. So welcome, Deb. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Missy. I was really sure. excited about this. Yeah, I'm excited too. So why don't we just jump right into your backstory and you know, tell us how you got to become a children's book author, and we can weave in there your story of your homeschooling journey as well. Okay. Well, I have, a, I have an amazingly varied background in careers. Um, I started off in radio and broadcasting. I was a broadcast news journalist uh, for about seven years. And then after that, I was in PR at a major aquarium. And during that time, I, I just sort of started revisiting children's books. And I think a lot of it had to do with nieces and nephews that I was buying books for. Mm-hmm. And I was loving these books again that I loved it as a child. And I thought, you know what? I bet I could write something. And I like most people who say they want to write a children's book. I think I could do this. So <laughs> I started writing children's books. And then I thought, you know what? I think I could probably send them out and see what happens. And I sent them out and I sent them out. And I, of course, got rejection after rejection and got a little discouraged. And then I want to say about seven years after starting to send them out, I got my first yes. And it was a book called Monkey See, Monkey Do, an Animal Exercise Book for You. And it was a book that taught children how to mimic the movements of animals. It was an exercise book and also sort of a natural history book that taught kids about the animals a little bit too. And then after that, while I was working at the aquarium, we had a dolphin named Stormy. And Stormy was a small dolphin that got separated from his mom in the Gulf Coast in Texas, um, Mm. in Corpus Christi. And uh, I wrote a story about him. I wrote it because he came to our aquarium. I live in Mystic in Connecticut, and he came to our local aquarium where I worked. And I wrote a story about his life, and that got published by a small Texas publisher in Austin. And then um, shortly after that, I had my son. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe I can write a little bit while I have him. And I tried a little bit, and then a lot happened while I was um, raising him. My mom got Alzheimer's. Um, I got sick myself and I really thought to myself, you know what, I waited a long time to have this child. I, I was an older mom as I had a career for many, many years. And I thought, I want to, I want to focus on him. So I put writing children's books aside, of course, homeschooling and having a child, I read to him constantly. So I constantly Mm -hmm. read and, and believe it or not, I kept a notebook of ideas because of course, when you're a writer, just, you're always flooded with ideas. So I just kept keeping ideas in a book and then Years went by, and I, as he got older, um, I started getting a little bit back into trying to get my books published. So I had had many manuscripts written for many years ago, um, and then I started writing a little bit more and started sending things out as he got older, and still nothing. And then when he launched, I thought, I'm really going to put the pedal to the metal and try to get back into this. I needed something to sort of refocus on me because I'd focused so much on him and I was really having a hard time when he left. So Mm. (laughs) I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to see what I can do to immerse myself in this. And I did. um, And it probably took me about six or seven years after thinking that and really making that decision to go after it, that all of this success is just sort of happening. And I, and I 
can't tell you where it's coming from. <laughs> just, yeah, just, right. I mean, after all these years of rejection, I'm, <laughs> people ask me, "What did What did you do? Like, how are you doing this?" I'm like, honestly, I really, I really don't know. After all these years of no's and so many no's, I mean, I I have had um, smaller presses pick up my books, but the books that are coming out in the next two years are with Random House and Source Books, and they're much larger publishers than have published me in the past, and that's not negating or saying that smaller presses and independent presses are not as important, but it's a big step for an author to, to mm -hmm. come this far and to finally reach this point. Right, right. Well, you said so much there that I think we can tie <laughs> into just life experience in general, which is that persistence. And if it's something you love to do, you're going to find the time to do it anyway. And um, I, I, I love that story because it reminds people that even if you get rejected and you don't find the place where you can take your book to the next level, it doesn't mean that that book doesn't have a place. It just means you haven't found it yet. Oh, um, absolutely. <clears throat> and actually the homeschool book that's coming out, a thank you letter to my homeschool. I wrote that several years ago. Um, and I hung on to it for a little while and then I, I edited it and it wasn't called a thank you letter to my homeschool. It was called homeschool is because I, what I wanted to do with that book was to show what a typical day of homeschool could be. And of course we all know it can look very different for different people. Um, but I thought, okay, well I'll use my day as an example or our day. And so I wrote that and I edited it. And I, at the time I had an agent and she sent it out to several um, editors and <laughs> it was sort of stymied. They were like a homeschool book. Mm -hmm. Oh, huh. <laughs> that's interesting. No, we like, you know, we like the idea, but we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> right. We don't know what to do with this. This is such a weird market. <laughs> right. Right. And so she and I parted ways and I kept sending it out because I really believe that there's, I mean, so the last traditionally published homeschool picture book for kids where they could actually see themselves on the pages of a book was in 2015. Um, and it's my home, my school, and it's, you know, it's a wonderful book, but it's like, okay, so it's, we need something else. It's almost, almost been 10 years. It's going to be 10 years that, that a traditionally published homeschool book has come out. Wow. And I, and I, yeah, it's amazing. So I pitched and pitched and I so here's the thing when I said, I really don't know. A lot of these things are timing and luck and who the editor is and what interests they have. So I came across an editor at Sourcebooks and she, so normally it can take them up to a year to get back to you when you pitch mm. them an idea. She got back to me that afternoon and oh, she wow. said, I love this idea. I have a really dear, dear friend who homeschools. So there's, there's your yep. link, right? There's your connection. Dear, yeah. I have a dear friend who homeschools. I loved watching her do that with her children, and I understand that they need a book. So it was a yes. Right. But, but then they changed the title, so I was fine with that. But, but they, they decided that – so they did a lot of market research on what title would probably work well with homeschool families. And because we're so grateful for this lifestyle, I guess they realized they came upon a thank you letter to my homeschool. Mm -hmm. so that's I do love that title. It's really sweet. And I, I understand it. And like I told you when we first – caught um or connected was that I had started doing the same thing for unschooling um because I was going to work uh on this piece for a virtual conference that didn't ever really come together and that was going to be my contribution because I was like you know unschooling for us as a former teacher and I worked in the public and private schools um never thought I would unschool that was never even a word in my vocabulary when first time I heard it I thought what is this craziness that people right. are saying, you know, <laughs> but again, it was a, a lovely longtime friend of mine who was doing it and ventured into that world. And she was a former teacher as well. So I was like, she's not, she knows what she's doing, but it still feels weird. All that to say is over time, I became smitten by the idea and sort of the way the unschooling world unfolded for us. And, and I felt that same way. I was like, I just feel like I have to think it somehow. Right. Um, so it's a great idea. And actually, this book is mostly if you were to, if you were to look at it, you would say it's an unschooling book because Okay. Yeah, it's really um because we did unschool a lot when he was younger. We didn't have lots and lots of structure and of course I was always worried that I wasn't doing enough structure and right. and I think when you and I emailed previously, I said I I now when I look back, I think I probably had 
too much structure because he was leading the way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, if I just listened and tuned into him, he was telling me where he wanted to go. So in this book um, are all the things, and that's, so this, this book in particular, I mean, I could actually cry and get choked. And I'm not that, I'm not that mm. kind of person when I think about this book, because it's a love letter to our life. It's yeah. just, it highlights our days and the things that we did. And they allowed me to put in the things that we did as a family. So he was on a robotics team, a Lego robotics team. That's in the book. He was a piano player and he had an amazing relationship with his piano teacher. And that is shown in the book. He loved lighthouses when he was little and we traveled all over to different lighthouses. We lived near an aquarium, the one I worked at, and he was there taking classes. Um, We collected snowflakes when he was little. They put that in the book. Um, He was a rock collector. We had a local nature center. He took classes there. That's in there. And then, of course, Our cat is in there, Lumpy, um, because he was there all the time. Yeah, (laughs) moral support, right? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I actually wrote a column about that um, about the fact that it's it's really important for a child to have an animal in the house and Mm. how it helps them grow, Um, especially boys. I think. Yeah, you know, because I I feel like girls get the benefit of sort of uh, nurturing baby dolls and babies and their siblings, possibly, and boys really can can learn to nurture something and animals tend to be that, that gateway for them. Or chase it through the house. Right, right. (laughs) Or wrestle with it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so tell us when the book is coming out. I know it's a pre-order now, so you can pre-order and is that correct? Did I say it that? Is and, okay. It is. And I, and I can encourage people to, and a lot of people don't like to pre-order because they're like, hey, I'll just get it when it comes out. But honestly, right. if you pre-order now, it really helps to elevate the book so that other homeschool families can find it and people who are considering homeschooling. So I didn't write this just for homeschool families. I wrote mm-hmm. it for people who don't have any idea what the day looks like. You know, right. what, what can I do if I want to homeschool? And so I'm hoping that it reaches them too. So if you if you don't pre-order, it kind of gets lost on the uh, algorithms on Amazon. And if you pre-order, it bumps it up a little bit. So anyway, okay. that, would be, that would be very helpful. And also going on to Goodreads and saying you want to read it. That's all you got to do is just click. Okay. I wanna read it. Yeah, those that's are two great things. to know. Get my yeah, sales are, stuff out. <laughs> yeah. These are avenues and things that I just don't know about. You know, I mean, I've always seen the pre-orders and people putting things out about pre-ordering the books, but it makes perfect sense that if you pre-order it, it's sort of telling everybody that, you know, Hey, there's actually some buzz about this and people are excited and right. th- that's good. Okay. Well, and let's dive into your homeschooling journey if we can. And so, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about that. You said you started, did you start when your son was school age and you had already decided ahead of time or was it, it one of those it evolved? Yeah, it sort of evolved. So I was an older mom. I had, I, like I said, I had many careers and I thought that that my work was very important. And then I got to a point in my thirties where I thought, you know what? I really want to have a child (laughs) and work and work has been wonderful and important, but there was just something in me that said, I got to do this. And, and then it took a long time for it to happen. And so I was an older mom and I decided, um, that I just wanted to be home with this child Mm -hmm. that I had wanted so desperately that it took so long for me to have. Um, and, and it's strange because when I was five months pregnant, I knew I had this innate sense that education was going to be a big part of what we did. And mm-hmm. and it wasn't because I was a super academic person. I just, I mean, I'd gone to college and, and I honestly did not love my primary school years and my you know high school year. They were okay. And I just wasn't a great, I didn't love learning until I was actually a senior in college. It clicked for me then. I just thought to myself, you know, these are things that I love learning about. And and, and it's strange that it took me that long. And I thought, I don't want it to take that long for my child to, to have mm. that passion for learning. So I had actually, when I was five months pregnant, I went to a Montessori school locally and I sat in on a class and I watched all these little kids moving around the room, doing their own thing, sort of working on woodworking. And I thought, this is what he's going to, I'm going to do, because I knew he was a boy, this is mm-hmm. what I'm going to do with him. I'm going to do Montessori. And so then I had him. And about six months afterwards, we happened to be at a dinner party with another couple and they had homeschooled their two children. And the son was home visiting from college. He was 18 years old because his grandmother was sick. She lived with them. And, um, and I had met, my husband and I had never met an 18 year old like that before. He was just the most engaging, warm, connected to his family, intelligent, all of these things that, I mean, we were like, wow, this kid's amazing. He was just an amazing. And then the mom took me down to her basement and she showed me all these containers of homeschool materials, the things that she did. And I just thought, and my husband was with me. And of course, my son, Zach, was on my hip at the time. And, and my husband turned to me and he said, you could do that, you know. And I yeah. Said, oh, <laughs> no, I couldn't. 
thought, I couldn't do that. He said, yes, yeah, you could. You could do that. He said, I know you could. And I, I had thought about it and I was like, boy. And then time went by and, you know, just continued to think about it. And then when he was about two, I went to a local homeschool support group and they were like, well, you're here kind of early, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but you know, if you want to be a part of the group, you can be here. And, and then it just took off. I mean, I just I absolutely loved watching him learn and I loved mm -hmm. tuning into it. And, and I mean, just knowing that he was, that he was so interested, made me more interested. Right. Um, I mean, we, I was, a, I'm a runner. And so when he was, you know, in my jogger at age <clears> two, he would, you know, go along the street with me and say, what's that say? what's that say? He was looking at all the signs and I would read him the signs. And I honestly, people always say to me, I just could never teach my child how to read. I don't know how you did that. I'm like, well, basically he taught himself to read <laughs> because mm -hmm. he would, he mm -hmm. would ask me what things said. And he pretty much, he was a sight learner. He just learned by looking at words. And of course, you know, I added into that and did what I needed to do, but he, you know, it's, it's, it's just a fascinating thing. And I wish people who didn't homeschool could get into that mindset of, of feeding into that, you know, when you see them wanting to learn something, you give them more, mm -hmm. <laughs> you give them more and you go with it. And, and that's where we basically went with, with most of his journey. Um, right. Think of, you know, what else I can add to that early, those early learning years, but. Um, well, the spousal yeah. support is huge, you know, giving that vote of confidence from your husband. I know some families struggle in that department where they, like the mom feels really connected to the right. idea <laughs> and excited. And then the husband might be, uh, I don't know, that seems a little far-fetched. And then, you know, they have to kind of slowly get on board. <clears throat> but um, so it's great, you know, that the two of you together were able to see the beauty in that possibility. Oh, um, and, and, he, and we were fortunate that we could. So people always say, you know what, I couldn't afford to do that. I couldn't mm -hmm. afford to stay home with my child. And I always tell people that we made a lot of choices to, sure. to, so that I could be home. Um, I mean, I, at the time I had a page to go phone, we didn't get a new car and most of my friends bought bigger homes. We live in a smaller home. And honestly, I look back, no regrets, absolutely yeah. no regrets for the time that I had with him and the sacrifices that we made for me to be here with him. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. We actually, um, so, uh, one of my friends and online, uh, connections, we wrote a guide for, uh, life unschooled. And that was one of the parts of it was to talk about the finances, because, you know, that's a part that people kind of almost shy away from, or maybe get a little bit nervous about talking about. And I wanted to highlight that as a, as a potential consideration, you know, we, Sometimes it's easy to say a quick no because of because of finances, but then if you can get creative, which is what life's all about, right? Like trying to figure out what path you want to go down and then let's figure out how to get there. And that to me has been sort of the mantra of our unschooling experience. It's like, where do you want to go? Now let's work backwards. So the right. same can be said for homeschooling. Like if you want to do it, how can you work to get there? Um, which, you know, some of the things that we considered were like, what do you do for childcare outside of business hours? you know, or when you, when you don't have school, what do you do? And you can do that during the day too. So, right. you know, the possibilities are there. Um, and it does take some sacrifices financially. We, we were the same way. We went with one car for a while. We didn't take elaborate vacations. We right. stayed very close to home um, because adventures can be everywhere, even in your own backyard. You know, they don't have to require getting on a plane and going far, far away even though that is fun too. <laughs> I won't yeah, discount that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when they're younger, I really do think that their world is so big already because they're so little and there's and they're absorbing everything that you don't have to necessarily do these real elaborate things. Right. Um, and, and you don't have to do everything. So, you know, when you're right. in a local co-op or you have, so I, I organized a lot of classes and we had people in our group who couldn't take the classes because they were mm -hmm. paid classes. And so they just didn't do them, but they're fine. I mean, they didn't mind doing, they did some, but they didn't do all of them. So it's just a lot of choosing. It's picking and choosing. Absolutely. It is quite a buffet, right? Buffet of choices. Oh, it um, is. So how old's your son now? So he is 23 years old. Okay. Um, he never went to a traditional school. We homeschooled straight through, um, like I said, when we started. Um, I, at least I started off structured. We did a lot of curriculum. Um, I mean, I don't want to say started off because when we started off, I just did a lot of reading. But I have to say when he hit about six, I did structure in some math and you know some writing. And 
and not a lot, but you know, trying to trying to realize that we needed to get to a certain point. I was worried. I was I mm-hmm. mean, to be to just frank. I was worried. I th- I'd never done this, and I didn't want I didn't want to mess my kid up. I thought, you know what, <laughs> I've got to make sure that I give him everything that he needs. So I really started off structured, and he really he was just very. And, and, and this is the this is the beauty of homeschooling. He had his strengths, and his strengths were math and science, and he just took off in the math department. We were doing our Singapore math books and he was just leaving me in the dust when we'd eat those books up like they were candy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah. so that by the time he was 11, I put him in. So I organized through a local community college. Um, I have a group of, we had a group of homeschool kids that we hung out with. It was a great support group locally. And I was part, sort of, I was the mom that coordinated a lot of the programs for us. And I found, um, found someone who helped us coordinate our local community college for our kids to take a variety of classes. So he needed math. He needed a more advanced math class. Mm. And they taught our kids, you know, math and um, English and history and, you know, science and a lot of different classes that they would nor they didn't really change their curriculum for our kids, but it was just no credit. So the kids started off that way and he started off that way in a math class. And then I knew immediately that first, first semester um, when he was taking that math class that he could take credit classes. So I, we enrolled him in a um, that next semester in a four credit math class and, and he did well. And, and this was did, how old he was in middle school? He was 11. He was 11. He was and 11. he credit for it for his like high school transcript? Um, yeah. So here's the thing. It, it, the, the, I didn't know at that time. I really didn't know. I was just like, oh, he needs this and I'm just going to give him what he needs and he, so he can keep up with the passion that he has for math. Right. And so right. we, I was just sending him to these classes and people kept saying to me, Deb, what are you going to do with all these credits he's getting? Because like I said, that first semester we took those classes and I realized that he was doing them and, and a lot of the kids were doing them. They were keeping up with, you know, the non-credit college class. So we just put them in regular college classes and um, and he just kept getting all kinds of credits it, from our community college. And people would ask me, what are you going to do with those credits? And I was like, I don't even know. I have no idea if, you know, they're going to transfer anywhere or what we're going to do with them. And then um, when he turned 15, I he enrolled into a um, early college experience program at our local university. And all those credits transferred in. Everything. Oh, and it, wow. And okay. it was like two, it was like two years worth of credits. It was crazy. And he had all these requirements, prerequisites, prerequisites already fulfilled when he went in um, to that early college experience. And then from there, he just transferred into that college and he graduated a, a couple of years in advance of, you know, when he would have. And I'm not saying this to brag. It's just, this is just the really cool thing about homeschooling. You can mm-hmm. build on their home, on their strengths and, and they just take it and run and, Graduated a couple of years in advance, and he's now at Brown University. Um, he has an electrical engineering degree from the University of Connecticut, and he's now at Brown getting uh, working towards a PhD in electrical engineering with a focus on semiconductors. Wow. That's I amazing. Know. That's <laughs> it's so amazing great. amazing story. And I'm it so, is. I'm so proud of him because... He just had the initiative to do this, you know, he just, mm-hmm. and not to say that it was always easy. And believe me, there were days when he was younger, when I was thinking I was going to put him in school because <laughs> he, mm. he was a pretty strong willed kid. Um, but he just took the initiative to learn and he loved to learn. And, and, and even now where he is, he will talk about, you know, he was a TA this past semester and he'll talk about, you know, TA and kids and, and, and kids initiative to learn and, and, you know, that it can't, sometimes it's not what he experienced as, as a homeschool kid. And I don't think he knows that it's, that it was homeschooling. I think he just thinks it's him. But I honestly believe that when you're an independent learner and you take the ball and run, <laughs> then, you know, it's just, you, you can do that with homeschooling. And I'm not yeah. sure you can do that quite as much when you're in a traditional school. Yeah, there's definitely some barriers in place when you're in a traditional program because, you're not really the driver of that experience. You're kind of a passenger and you're, you know, you're given a schedule, you're given the classes you're going to take and there's a, an order of things. And if you get too far ahead, sometimes there's not really a place for you, you know, almost have to sit and wait. Um, And it's not, it's just the way the system is, you know, it's impossible. I mean, I was a former teacher, so I know what it's like to have a classroom full of kids where everybody has a different level that they're at and you kind of have to, 
teach to the middle um, Absolutely. and do the best you can to give the kids that need that extra leg up what they need. And then the same for the others. And it's all about the, the manpower, you know, we just don't have enough people to it's really zero that you, in. That you brought that up because when he was really young and I was still figuring out whether we were going to do this, I went to our local library and there was a guy that came to talk. He had grown children who he'd, he'd homeschooled. And that room was packed with parents who were considering homeschooling. And I mean, oh. packed. And in the back of the room, um, someone raised their hand and she was a seventh grade teacher. And she said, I just have to share with all of you that are, you know, raising concerns that you couldn't do this. There isn't one of you in this room that could could not do a better job than I can do with a room of 25 mm. kids. She said, when I'm, when I'm doing a lesson plan on, say, you know, Egyptian history, and there's a kid that's so fueled and, and he or she really wants more, I can't say, well, let's keep going. We got to move on. She said, I got to keep well, I'm moving on for the rest of the kids who may or may not be interested and we have other things to cover. She said, so that child, they're either going to take the initiative at home, which probably they can because they got other things going on with school. Mm-hmm. She said, so you know, just, I want to give you that vote of confidence that you can do this. So there was a bit that that's a really good point to make. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, it's always going to be better to do one-on-one or small groups than it is large groups. And I mean, if there's some basic piece of information that you're just trying to collect as an individual and you go to a a seminar or a workshop, that's different. But if you're really trying to learn and nail down and drill down, it's impossible to do in a setting where, there's a curriculum to get through and there's boxes to check and there's tests to take and there's 17, 18, 25 other people that have to do the same thing. So yeah, the homeschooling experience can really be the most customizable thing. Um, it is. And it's so funny because I have to tell you that, so not only do I have a book call, coming out called a thank you letter to my homeschool, but I have a book coming out the following year called a thank you letter to my teacher. And it's about teachers in school. So Aww. that same publisher asked me if I would write that second book as part of the series that they were doing. And so I could write that because I did have teachers that I, I mean, I mentioned that I wasn't a passionate learner when I was really young, but I had teachers that made a huge impact on my life. And one of the things that I worried about when I considered homeschooling my son was, well, will he have teachers that he loves? Like I had teachers that really inspired me. And, and he did, you know, you know that, that we hire teachers. We don't do this all ourselves. <laughs> so, um, so that book is coming out. So I, I always want people to know, and, and this is, the, you know, that I don't really think there's one way or the other that's the best for everybody. And there are mm-hmm. some people that probably should not homeschool. <laughs> some right. people that, there's some families that just wouldn't work for them. Um, so it's, it's just, it's whatever works best. Absolutely. Well, and that, I think it goes back to the principle of following the child. You know, if the child is very energetic and outgoing and extroverted and really likes to be around a bunch of people and you're not able to quite create that environment for them in the homeschool setting, even if you have co-ops and things like that, I mean, that's something to consider. I know we ran into that with some of the families that we interacted with that <clears throat> they just, excuse me, their kids just really required that like constant buzz of people. Right. Um, and school was just a better environment for them for that reason. Um, and then you've got kids who are a little bit more introverted and quiet and they'd like to take their, their, you know, learning a little slower and at a different pace. And in that regard, homeschooling was a beautiful match. Um, I know I found with my kids, there were kind of a neat combination of both, especially different stages in their lives. And, you know, I, I noticed about around 14, 15, both of them had this obvious shift of like, I need more, I want more, you know, and they kind of sought it out and we made it happen. So we, we did the dual enrollment program oh, that we, okay. we have here. So they can take college level courses at the local community college, and then they get high school credit for it and college credit. So by the time they finish high school, they will have basically an associate's degree and then they can apply to a four-year college and already have two years under the belt. So okay, so pretty much what we did. Yeah. It's very, very similar. Um, well, I wanted to talk about your homeschool writing. So one of the things I did, I did a little research on you before we talked and I saw that you had a column that you wrote for the Daily Telegram. So that was your local newspaper at the time. No, actually, I that was a syndicated column, and and I had started writing it for my local newspaper, the Norwich Bulletin, which is local, and then and then it was picked up by the Gatehouse News Service, so it was in 
250 print newspapers. And then, of oh. course, it was online. I know. It was all over the country wow. during that time. Okay. It was, yeah, I was so excited about that. So, yeah, I said I didn't write children's books during that time, but I was writing that column about our homeschooling journey. And I was loving that. I mm-hmm. loved writing about that because it was just, it was like writing a public journal. Yeah. Of, uh, well, and that's what I was going to say. Those The columns are, are, they're not very long, but they just zero in on a very specific area that you're experiencing at that point in time. So I love that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. And I still, I go back and read those just so I can revisit our days because he was little when I started that. He was like six or seven Mm. and I only wrote it for a couple of years. Um, and then it it just petered out. But it, the reason that I decided to do that was, you know, to introduce people to what homeschooling days could look like and also to just bridge the gap so that people who don't homeschool would understand that it's it's not strange (laughs) because at that time it was still, you know, not considered to be more mainstream. I mean, so many people are doing it now and it wasn't that way when he, you know, and I were just starting out. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I was going to say I, there was one that, um, well, there's a couple that I pulled out that I wanted to highlight. And one of them was um, <clears throat> taking a chance with homeschooling can be worth the risk. And you talk about the experiences that you've had with other people who weren't homeschooling and they were like, I never could do that. Right. So, you know, do you want to talk about that a little bit? How, yeah. you know, I'm glad you told me what I said because it was, <laughs> <laughs> that was 15, a long time ago. ago. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people would say that I could, I could never do that. And they even say that to me now when I tell them what we did, they're like, oh my goodness, how could you do that? Why did, why did you do that? I could never do that. And I, I just think to myself that, that didn't really, so that, that, you know, it did come into play. I did, I was worried that I wasn't going to give him everything that he needs. And I, and I went through that the entire time until he, until he actually became enrolled in college and actually probably not until he got his degree. Did I really feel like, okay, whew, you know, we did this because yeah. it was, you know, you're taking on a lot of responsibility to, to do that. Um, but like I said, it's just, you know, it's, it's a leap of faith. <laughs> it is a leap of faith. It is. Yeah. And you know, I like what you said too. It's a trial run. And if it fails, you can go back to school. It's not right. like it, you have to do this right now and commit to it from now until they they graduate high school. And that's the way we kind of approached it too. I said, you know, let's try it. Let's do it. Every year we can revisit. We can, I can ask them, are they good? You want to try something different? And, you know, we would ebb and flow and switch it, change gears as we needed. So I like that there is that option here. You know, we have that flexibility to be that way. Oh, absolutely. Um, So I always actually try to tell people that who, you know, tell me their children are being bullied at school. I'm like, pull them out, pull them mm -hmm. out and try this. And then if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you find another school, not put them back in the same school. But people, I think, get so locked into where this one mindset and this is where we need to stay and this is the way it has to be. And and, and like you just said, that you can you can sort of go back and forth. Most of our homeschool community, our local community, went to high school when they got to high school age. They went to a traditional high school. So he was one of the very few that went straight through. Um, so there's that, you know, you can do it when they're younger and then when they get older and you feel like, you know, when they're 14, 15, like you mentioned, your kids need it a little bit more, then then they can go to high school if that's, yeah. you know, if that works for them. Yep. Well, and it's always important too, I think, to reach out to the local homeschool communities, you know, and find those co-ops and find support groups. And the fact that you had, did you say it was at a library that somebody offered to talk about homeschooling? It it was, yeah. 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 Libraries tend to be a great space for that and expanding our understanding of what the options are. Um, And then the other thing you mentioned too, with earlier, you were talking about being a type A personality and wanting to have that structure, but you were kind of you're like making sure because there's there is a lot of fear, right? This is a template. This is something you haven't done before. Nobody has really said to you, "Hey, Deb, here's how this works. Now, now go do that." And so we worry that we might be missing something, or that our kids would fall behind, or we won't give them everything that they need. Um, right. And so I know you wrote that one uh, piece. It said warmer weather time for less intense education, and it was really more about you letting go. Um, right. And not needing to have this intense structure all throughout the summer months. Um, so how, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Not necessarily that what you wrote, but just sort of your experience with that. Like where, what, what particular things were going on with you and your kids where you started seeing that learning was happening all the time and that you didn't have to have such an intense structure 
Yeah, I think it's just looking at things differently. So when he when he developed an interest in, in rocks and minerals, you know, that just became an opportunity for us to go with this really neat um, it was sort of a new age store that sold really cool rocks and minerals. Those were our trips in the summer. We'd do that and, you know, we'd bring them home and we just cataloging them and looking at them and looking them up and learning more about them just became you know, fun learning. It mm -hmm. wasn't part of a structured anything that we did. And boy, did he learn a lot during that time. And, um, you know, just learning about stars and astronomy. We have a local, um, we, we live near a seaport and they have a small planetarium. And um, when he was really young, just going over there and, and sometimes we'd go in the winter and no, we, we live in a summer destination and we'd go in the winter and there was a um, it was actually the name of the, they've named it after this gentleman who was there, Don Truergy. He would be there by himself and he would give me and Zach our own private talk in the planetarium. And that wow. just developed this <laughs> huge, and he'd say, so Zach, what are your questions? And it was just, it was just the two of us sitting there in the talk with him. And it just developed this huge passion for things like that. And, and then actually, I'll just add this, as he got old, when he got older, he actually volunteered at that planetarium and gave Aww. the talk, gave the talks himself yeah. uh, over the summer because he had just developed such a, you know, a love of that place and, and of those people and just the, the topic. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's just, even collecting shells on the beach, you know, we'd come home and we'd look at shells. What's a slipper shell? What are these shells that we're finding on the Cape when we go there every summer? And, um, and lighthouses, same thing. We were visiting lighthouses on the Cape and that just sparked an interest um, one summer and we would start traveling. When we were in Maine, we'd always go to a lighthouse and learn about Fresnel lenses. And, um, you know, just it's just amazing that, you know, something can spark in them and, and, and in you too. So that's mm -hmm. what I really miss. I miss learning with him. So yeah. he and I actually just wrote, speaking of children's books, he and I wrote a manuscript together last summer because we were talking and he said, I was driving him back to school and he said, you know, you should write a book about semiconductors because people don't know what they are and they're everywhere. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. They're everywhere. He said, you know, you, we wouldn't have the modern world if you didn't have semiconductors. They're in your phone. You're in, you know, everything that we have. And I said, I don't think I could do that. And he said, I'll do it with you. So he co-authored it with me and I actually pitched it around and I got same thing I got with a homeschooling manuscript. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting, but a little lofty, maybe a little esoteric. I'm not sure. Um, and I wrote it sort of as a cool, the, the voice of coming from the voice of a semiconductor. And, um, and so actually I did pitch it to one of my editors and he's, he's considering it. So it's, it's an important story. So I would love that if that got published by both of us because oh, yeah. he inspires me. He always mm -hmm. inspired me from the time he was really young to, to want to learn about things that I, like I said, I, I wasn't math and science minded. Um, and I really became that watching his love of it. And I wish he had become him. He's, he, he wrote this with me. He's still not a lover of writing. Um, that was when I talk about his strengths in math and science, writing was like, eh. I mean, it wasn't like he was poor at it. He just didn't have an interest in it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like I said, we just, just being around your kids and who you are and who they are, you just feed off of each other and go from there. Yeah. Well, and you know, you, you what you're explaining is exactly what I talk to people about all the time is just that the the interest led learning. It's fascinating. It's deep. It's joyful, right? It's delightful. You know, kids who have an interest in something, the amount of things that they're able to absorb and take in, it's like us as adults. You know, once we become interested in something, we find all the different ways to get that information, to, right. to read a book, to talk to a person. Um, and really kids are no different. And obviously the biggest difference is that they need us to drive them there to make the phone calls, <laughs> you know, right. to coordinate stuff. But really the learning is, is all on them. And, um, and I love what you had described too about, you know, just going to pick up shells and how it's not, it doesn't stop there. It, you bring it home and then you look them up and you catalog them. Um, I mean, what better way to take something that's of interest and just watch the different ways that it can go out into the world and, and almost like on, you know, the legs of an octopus, there's so many different directions it can go. Um, and I think that's the beauty of our curiosity, you know, which is one of the things when, I was reading about the books that you write, that that was part of your sort of mission when you write a book is to encourage curiosity. So um, why don't you talk to us about some of the other books you've written and kind of the inspiration for those? 
Yeah, so I'll give you a rundown of my books and sort of a sort of a timeline of what's happening next year. So, a thank you letter to my homeschool is the first one that comes out in 2025, and that's April 1st of next year. And then after that, I have a little golden book coming out called Fourth of July Fun, and it's about um, celebrating the Fourth of July. I'm love my country. And I decided that I would Mm -hmm. write a 4th of July book. Um, And then in August, I have another school book. It's called I'm a pre-K kid. I'm a preschool kid. And I wrote that book because when my niece's little boy was going to preschool, he was sort of apprehensive. And I looked and I couldn't find a book that sort of featured a child that wasn't so sure about going there. Mm, And so I wrote that and that is coming out um, probably August. And then I have Good Night Broom coming out, which is a spinoff uh, on Good Night Moon. I cannot wait for that one, by the way. I, know. I love that. I was like, oh my God, that's so cute. <laughs> I'm really excited about that one. Um, that one's coming out with um, Penguin Workshop, Random House, um, probably August or September in time for, in time for Halloween. Yep. It's a little witch in her room saying good night to all little witchy things so that, yeah that was a lot of fun <laughs> so to write. great yeah. yeah really loved that and then um i have another one coming out in the fall called eco the little electric taxi and that hasn't been announced yet um but that one is about an electric taxi and it's a vehicle book but it's got a little spin on it that you know this electric taxi helps to keep the city cleaner because it's electric. Um, mm-hmm. But that one also was inspired by my son because he's an electrical engineer and he's always telling me the importance of electric vehicles and how they contribute to keeping our environment cleaner. So that one's coming in. I'm, I'm really excited about that one. And then the next one after that is Christmas Day Cheer. And it's a little golden book, another little golden book. So I have three little golden books coming out next year. Um, and that's just a little mouse family counting down to the till Christmas Day. Okay, so, and, then, and then next year, the year after that, I have two more that are the, the thank you letter to my teacher is coming out. And then I have one more that's yet to be announced. That is something because I hear you say that and I'm like, 2026, I am so impatient. I don't know how you do it. Like, how do you wait that long? You've already oh. written it. You've already got an, so you already have an illustrator and it's already ready to go or you're still working to get an illustrator and things like that. So even announcing these books, so I've known about these books for about a year and a half and I haven't been able to announce them until oh the you know gosh. until the editor finds an illustrator. So you don't find your illustrator unless you work with a really tiny publisher. The bigger presses pick, they pick the illustrator because they know what will work best with your. Story. I gotcha. Okay, and, I, and I've never been disappointed. I've always been really thrilled with every illustrator they've chosen. Um, but anyway, it takes a long time for that illustrator to create that beautiful work. And then once that happens, you know, there are a lot of different steps that have to be taken before they can actually announce it. So it takes about two years once you've signed the deal to wow. you know, for, for a book to come out. So yeah, these are, these are books that I've known about for a while. And right now I'm, I'm pitching for 2027. How so, about that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's interesting stuff to know, you know, I don't think people quite understand, at least I don't, the, the amount of time that's some involved with this, you know, I guess with the internet age and the immediacy of everything. And of course, with the self-publishing world, uh, I imagine there's plenty of people in my seat who think, oh, you just get an idea, you put it together and it's ready in six months, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> no, no. And yeah. It's always so funny. Whenever I, you and I talked about this, whenever I mentioned to people that I have these books coming, they say, oh, I want to write a children's book. <laughs> so yeah. a, lot of people, a lot of people want to write a children's book. And I get that. I do, I do understand there's, an, and it's probably because we are all children inside, right? We still yeah. are little kids and we have ideas about things and the way we see the world, the way our children saw the world, books that we've read that touched us in a certain way. Um, so everybody wants to write. But my, my biggest advice, and I actually teach adults too. I, so I, I, I write for the very young children, like, like toddlers, and I also teach my students are ages right now. So I started off teaching this class and people were whatever age they were, but then I took it to a retirement community and I teach students a memoir writing class. Um, and my students are average age, like 85 to 100 years old. Oh, <laughs> they're, wow. And they're still writing, they write their life stories and it's the coolest thing. It's one of the coolest things that I do to like, and some of them have said, that they just feel like actually, actually, some of them have said to me, "Now I can die." I wrote my life story. Oh my gosh! I feel, I feel like I can die because I feel like I got it out on paper. My family will always have it, and I just wanted this to be out there. But anything mm. I so, so I always tell them, you you can't write 
in the genre that you want to write in unless you read really extensively in it. So when people tell me they want to write a children's book, I tell my, that's them the same thing I tell my older students, then read. Mm -hmm. Read memoir for them and read children's books and read hundreds of them. I, mean, I wish you could see my dining room table right now. I go to the library and I've always got stacks of the latest children's books out there. You know, what's what's out there? What's, you know, what's popular? What's selling? What's What do people need to know about? Where, where is there a gap in the market? Yeah. So when you're yeah. writing, you, you need to really do your research because you, you can't write unless you read. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so true. Yes. Well, and that memoir writing, what an amazing service you're offering that that group of people because I think we all have a story in us you know I mean oh, we absolutely. just do not <laughs> yeah. everybody feels like they're a quote unquote a writer but if they can be connected with other people who are doing the same thing and saying you know let's just try to get these ideas out on paper it doesn't have to be perfect just tell your story um my grandmother gave us that gift. She died at 100 oh. in 2019. And probably about 20 years prior, she was taking notes and she kept writing down things about her story. And so I took them all and I put them in a book that I created for her children, which were um, my mom and two aunts. Um, and I titled them all and gave them, you know, like the names of the different little essays that she wrote. And it is just the biggest treasure because I really got to see the world through her eyes and she oh, grew absolutely. up, you know, in yeah. the, the depression and lived on a farm and it was a very hard life. Um, and to be able to have those stories and look back on them are just such treasure. So gosh, I know what you're doing with this population though their their family will be very grateful to have it in years to come so i always wow. tell them that they should pay me to teach that class yes <laughs> because, there you go. I, I leave that class and i'm so fueled by their stories and mm. by just their enthusiasm I, I come home and my husband will say oh my goodness you're like a to you come through the door and you're so animated when you come home from yeah. teaching that class and it's because they're so excited about telling their stories and yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I've been with some of them. I've been there for like nine years and one of them just turned 100 years old. And I have to tell you, this is sort of an aside, but they've taught me so much about aging well. I so my, I told you my mother had Alzheimer's, so I don't yeah. really get a good example of and of someone aging well. And and they're like, I mean, one of my students just turned 100 and we threw a party for her and she didn't show up. And we were like, well, where were you? Where were you? We had Prosecco and we had crystal glasses. For yeah. <laughs> brownies. And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just started a new class. It's a, it's a watercolor class. And I, I just had to go. I couldn't miss it. And, and I've got a new, um, all my work is in this exhibit called the budding art <laughs> exhibit. I'm thinking a hundred years old, the budding art exhibit. It's How just, about that? It fascinates me to be, so that's, you know, sort of a little bit of wisdom in here. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw in. It's just, you got to constantly try new things, you know? Absolutely. And I think being Absolutely. a homeschool, being a homeschool mom sort of ties into that, right? Because mm -hmm. we we're constantly doing that with our kids. And so, and I told you, I miss learning with my son, but I'm constantly trying to do the same thing now that he's not here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it also encourages people to slow down. Like you don't have to do everything by the time you're 35. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and this idea that you're behind if you don't have these things checked off before, you know, whatever age. I mean, obviously there are certain things that make sense to do on the earlier side of life, but when it comes to being creative and sort of branching out of your comfort zone, that can happen at any point in time. And I, oh my gosh, that's so inspirational. Thank you for yeah. sharing that story. Well, honestly, so people say that to me sometimes too about homeschooling. I remember his piano teacher saying to me one day, we were walking out after the lesson and he said, so homeschooling, like, where do you come into the equation? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, like, we, you know, my wife has all these interests and she does all these things because my son is at school all day. And what are you going to do? And I said, I, I don't I have no worry about that. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, there were there were times that maybe I wanted to do. You know, I was writing my column at the time. And maybe there were times I would want to write some of the ideas that I had, some of the children's stories. But and I probably could have done it. But there were, like I said, there were so many other things that were happening during that time, and I just had to spread myself very thinly. But there are people that say, I don't want to homeschool because I, there are so many things I want to do for me. Mm. You know, like you said, you don't have to do them all when your child is small. And, and, mm -mm. and by the time they launch, you hopefully are still doing okay. <laughs> you yeah. still have yeah. the energy to do the things that you need to do for the rest of your life. And, mm -hmm. and, well, and there are some those. things that you can do as a parent in um, conjunction with your kids, you know, yeah. I mean, th the one thing that I loved so much about our homeschooling experience was that I loved to be outside. I loved nature. I loved going to parks and hikes and things like that. And the kids love it too, you know, yeah, so was I was us. getting filled up. They were getting filled up and 
when I was, there were certain things that I wanted to do that didn't really include them. I would just set aside time to do it. You know, I actually took some, um, uh, art classes. So I went to do those a couple of, um, times a month. Uh, and then actually at one point my daughter ended up joining me cause she was really into art too. And the instructor was a friend and she was like, of course, bring her, you know? So she got to learn and what witness her mom doing something that she enjoyed and loved. And then she got to, you know, some benefit from it as well. So that's a great, not, yeah. yeah. For them to see you doing it, I think is really, right. Yeah. They, so you're a great example. So it's so funny you're mentioning that because I, I have a note in front of me that I wanted to mention that yes, so we do bring to them our interests and our passions. I started a group locally. Um, there was a Scholastic. I don't even know if Scholastic does it anymore. And it's it's a program called Kids Are Authors Too. And so I pulled a group of our homeschool kids together and had them write a children's book when they were younger. And they submitted it to this contest. And they actually won honorable mention. Um, oh. Yeah, it was kind of a cool thing. They wrote a they, they did research on all of the library cats in the country and they sort of compiled them and put a little book together. Um, but yeah, we bring our interests to our kids, you know, and mm-hmm. they can, can pick up little pieces of that. Um, and I think my son did that with my husband too, because um, my husband was, my husband has a physics degree, so he would take them out into the garage and they would build lasers and measure things. And so that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just also mentioning that. So, you know, when, when, when he got to college age and I was saying that he was in in college, that was something where my husband stepped in. So I was doing sort of the younger years and because I couldn't, I couldn't tutor him in calculus (laughs) and -hmm. differential equations and, and some of the science classes that he was taking, my husband stepped in and did a lot of tutoring for him with that. And, and it was that, that is what I think a lot of people don't realize you can do. I mean, they can do that if their kids are in school too. Um, but, but that with homeschooling seemed to take on a, a, a and they bonded through that and they still talk about that, you know, those mm-hmm. years that, that he really helped him through some pretty difficult material. I believe it. Yeah. My husband, that's so funny. My husband has a physics, uh, he's in, he's a physics major as well. And he went into engineering, but oh, how fun. Um, so did my husband, I know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, and I always say too that homeschooling is a family affair. You know, it's not mom and child alone doing things isolated. It's it's living and learning together, and we all contribute. You know, we pour into our kids various different pieces of information and our own skill set and our talents and our interest, and um, they do the same to us. I mean, I don't know how many times my kids started getting into something that I was like, "Huh, I didn't know about that." Now I need to go research this a little bit more or dig into it. Um, till my satisfaction, because sometimes they'd be done with it. And I'm like, Oh, no, no, I'm not taking those books back yet. I still need to, I still need <laughs> to read too. up on this. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. So he, he did Suzuki piano lessons. And so I remember when he started using two hands, I was like, Oh my, God, you have to play with, and he said, well, you have to do it because it's Suzuki. So the parent has to play. Okay. I, to, <laughs> I was like, I have to play the piano with two hands. And I remember struggling through twinkle, twinkle, little star with my two hands. Cause I'd never played the piano before. And then I just developed a passion for, I didn't want to take his piano, his instrument. So I started playing the guitar on my own. And so, yeah, they, they definitely spur a lot of interest for us mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's so fun to watch. Um, well, before we wrap up, I would love it if you would just kind of give us like a little bit more insight on, especially if anybody's listening who has a child who's creative and who likes to write and who enjoys story, you know, what are some things that you can, can offer to encourage the parent to support them or, ideas of things to do in the community. I mean, a lot of things you mentioned already that I think people can take and and run with, but are there any particular things that pop up for you that might be supportive to a parent who has a kid who's interested in story writing or even a parent themselves? Yeah. Um, you know, take a class. So that's, that's what I usually tell people. And my students will always say this to me. I, I would never write if I didn't have your class because I pay for it. <laughs> so oh, okay. As silly as that sounds, people, I will avoid writing at all costs. I'll clean the kitchen. I'll go outside and weed the garden. I, I will find other things, you know, if I have a writing deadline, a lot of times, you know, it's a challenging thing to sit down and write out an idea or a Mm -hmm. story. So we will avoid, but if you have a class and you have a deadline and you paid for it, you will do it. There's that accountability piece, right? (laughs) Yes. It's huge. And I'm glad you mentioned that word because at at one point I had an accountability partner where I would actually, you know, check in with them. I've gone this far on the story and we take a look. So, you know, having, having a, 
a buddy for kids, you know, you have an accountability partner who writes with you. That's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, but finding a class or creating a class, if you're a homeschool mom and there isn't one around or homeschool parent, and there isn't one around that you know of, um, creating a class and, and doing it with prompts, with writing prompts. So my, my writing class for adults, we use writing prompts because they'll often say to me, I want to write my life story, but I don't know where to begin. What, what, mm. You know, this, it's so big. Where do I start? So I will create prompts for them and, um, and they go from there. And it's amazing how it, it always speaks to something in their life. It gets them to write about something. So, um, you know, for kids, that's probably my biggest suggestion. I actually just had a, um, a 22 year old ask me this question. She wants to write novels and she asked me, what, what do I do? And, um, and I told her the same thing. I said, you've, you've got to join uh, some kind of a group, even if it's a local library group, um, with like-minded people who, are as focused or, or want to be as focused because writing is, you know, I talk about math and science and it wasn't my thing, but writing is a different kind of challenge. And, and it's just, it takes a lot of fortitude. And like you said earlier, a lot of persistence mm-hmm. um, and you have to focus. And so if you have other people that are doing it with you, it, it's definitely helpful. Yeah. Well, and I'll pick up the human behavior psychology side of it, which is that we do avoid challenges, you know, as humans, we're like, yep. mm, this is a little bit, <laughs> this is making me uncomfortable and I'm ready to stop now, you know? So we cheat ourselves by being like, uh, I'll do that later. I'll put it off. But it actually makes us more, um, it sticks us to a schedule and, and, the, and we, and of course we benefit from it, you know, when we go, okay, this is really important to me. I'm setting aside time to do it. I'm going to make this a priority. And then, you know, there's benefit to that it's not immediate. And that's the other part that you really do have to stick with it. And, oh, and that's my whole suggestion. So, you know, you said you wanted to talk a little bit about my writing journey and that that's, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge example of persistence and not giving up. And mm-hmm. when people say they want to be a published writer, you just cannot give up. And, and that doesn't mean just spinning your reels and doing the same thing you always did the same way. It's, it's, it's really learning your craft. And if you're not getting published and you're trying and you, you don't know why, it's finding an editor, it's finding someone to read your stuff, it's writing something else that's not working on the same piece over and over again. So mm. it's, a lot of, um, it's a lot of I'm just not going to quit. And and that's where I'm at right now. I'm just, I think all of these years of not quitting and, and, and if you knew how old I was, oh my goodness, why didn't, (laughs) why didn't she quit? It's just really amazing that I stayed with this for as long as I did, because it was, it was a long, long journey. And I actually just posted something on Instagram that I really wish my mother was still here to see where I've come because she kept telling me that you just can't quit. You just, you need some luck. You need some serendipity. Something's got to, and, and I think a lot of it, I hate to say that because it just sounds so willy nilly, but a lot of it is that it's just being in the right place at the right time, mm-hmm. you know, and having done the work and all of a sudden things sort of start to align for you. Well, I think it's the book Outliers. I'm pretty sure it was Malcolm Gladwell, maybe. Am I saying that right? I'll have to look it up and correct myself if I'm not. But, um, in, and that there's a ton of stories in there like that, which is this idea that, you know, you just don't know when it's going to happen, when the connection's going to be made, when you're going to meet the right person. And when like your example, where the person that's an editor called you that same day, which was unheard of oh. because she <laughs> happened to have a friend who was living that lifestyle and it connected with her. So yeah, it's, it, it really is a trial, trial and error and, um, and just and keeping at it. And I, I believe that is such a good message for anything that we're doing, homeschooling, raising children, you know, I mean, kids change and ebb and flow and relationships change and family dynamics change, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it won't get better if it's, you're kind of in a rut at this point in time. Right. And I think people always want they want it today. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants everything today. And it's just, it's, I always told my son, anything that is really worthwhile takes a lot of effort and a lot of, you know, trial and error. And then you, and then you get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, in our social media days, we, we see the, the fruits of the labor, you know, right. we don't get to see the labor <laughs> and, and people go, Oh, well, they just made it. I'm like, you don't know their backstory. You don't know how much time they really spent doing the thing. 
Um, it's so true. Yeah. So maybe we need to create a new social media cha- uh, channel <laughs> of just like the labor part, <laughs> not, not what, not what happens after the fact, but what happens during. Uh, well, Deb, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing your story. It's so fascinating. And I love all these books that you have coming out and it's such an inspirational story too. Um, and just a reminder, you know, that if you love something, let that love uh, of it fuel you and just keep doing it because yep. there's, there's some, some reward that you're seeking will, will eventually come, come into, uh, into play. Um, is there anything else you want to offer or share or make, well, you know what, let's make sure everybody knows where to find you. So why don't you share us your social um, media? Right. Yeah. Um, it's at Deb Adamson books on both, uh, Instagram and X or Twitter. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. That's probably the place that I can be mostly found. I also have a website, Deb Adamson.com. Okay. Um, and you can take a look at, you know, some of my books that are already published because I don't really have the new ones out there yet. Um, but yeah, look for this book, look for a thank you letter to my homeschool, because I really, like I said, I think families, they'll really thrill at seeing a child's. So here's the thing too, about this book. It's kind of funny The the main character looks like my son when he Aww. was little and the illustrator <laughs> never saw him. And so it's weird how things that she told me, I can't tell you how many times that happens when I will go to do something. <laughs> so you are just, kidding me. Yeah. It's sort of wow. a strange thing. He's a, he's a, little kid with sort of dirty blonde hair with glasses. And I thought, wow, that is so, when I saw it, I thought that is the strangest thing. So, um, yeah, just, you know, you, you may see your own life on the pages of this book, mm-hmm. which it, as a homeschool family is just a cool thing to, that really to do is. that. It really <laughs> is. Yep. Well, and, and I know you have an author page too on Amazon as well, I do. um, that people can follow you and then get updates. So, um, well, thank you. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Missy. I appreciate it. It went by so fast. It did. <laughs> it does. The hours do fly. <laughs> yeah. I thought an hour. I have to talk for an hour. That's a lot. But we, you know, we made it very comfortable. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. To learn more about guests on the podcast and to stay up to date on how they are showing up to make the world a better place for children and families, please check the show notes. To become a part of the great educational awakening and to keep up with my latest writings, offerings, and workshops, be sure you're signed up for my Substack newsletter. You can also follow along on social media at Let em Go Barefoot. That's L-E-T-E-M-G-O Barefoot. If you are new to homeschooling, new to unschooling, or are simply unschooling curious but not sure where to start, We now have a beautiful 43-page downloadable guide that walks you through the how and why of self-directed education and child-led learning, as well as responses to common questions and concerns around academics, motivation, college, community, and more. You can find a link to purchase your copy in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. As always, stay curious, stay connected, and stay aware. Until next time.